she was somebody who put up with nothing from anyone, for one, right? Um, here is somebody who's um, a Polish Jewish woman and disabled, okay? So four strikes already, okay? Coming to Germany in 1896, and within a few years, she's fought her way into the leadership of the biggest socialist party on earth, but she's not doing so by uh, trying to kiss up to the party officials. She's doing so by taking aim at some of the major theoreticians of the Second International. Uh, and that is part of that humanism. That is when she smells that Bernstein and others around him are um, moving away from the principle of emancipation that is central to Marxism, she goes after him in the re revisionist controversy. And when people tell her to tone it down, uh, she ups the ante, in other words, and she increases the critique, not because of a vengeful attitude towards an individual or even a political position, but because she thought what was at issue here was the principles of, 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 of liberation. And that is a fierce commitment that characterized, I think, her entire life. So um, in her um, work within the uh, Social Democratic Party in Germany, you also see it in um, her relationships with women comrades, for instance. Uh, people often have overlooked the extent to which she actually was interested and in some cases even involved directly or indirectly in the women's movement, or socialist women's movement of the time. When you look at her closest friendships within the party as well, many of them with, with leading women within the party and women activists. Um, and uh, she was somebody who clearly gave an aura to other people of, um, of a deep commitment to social transformation, but also an interest in other people's lives and other people's concerns. So she wasn't somebody simply talking over the heads of others. This is saying that I think kind of characterizes the spirit of Luxembourg, and that is that Marxism is a theory of liberation or it is nothing. Uh, it's not a, a theory to uh, impose one form of domination in replacement of another. It's not simply about replacing private property with collective property or the free market with statified property. It's about freeing the individual from alienation, depersonalization, and exploitation. Uh, and in that sense, I think Luxembourg lived by that principle that Marxism is nothing if not a philosophy of liberation um, that aims at liberating the individual from all forms of oppression. So she was a humanist in that sense. Um, in other words, I think from a very early age, she had a deep uh, revulsion simply against um, man's inhumanity to humanity. Uh, any form of discrimination, oppression, she was, had a high-tuned level of sensitivity uh, to suffering. And that you need that to be a revolutionary. And you need to have that kind of disgust in your stomach for this, the capitalist system as its entirety. But some people stop there, right? And if you stop there, you're at resentment. You're at uh, rejection of the system, your anger and uh, negation, simply for the sake of negation. But for Luxembourg, that went along, however, with the love of humanity. She had a love of uh, human beings, of what Marx might call the species being of humanity, our capacity for conscious, purposeful creation. Uh, she was somebody who was as fascinated by natural science and art as by politics. Uh, she was somebody who, um, uh, wouldn't allow uh, her commitment to political organization, revolutionary struggle to get in the way of developing herself as a person, as an individual, uh, both in her emotional life and in her uh, theoretical political life. So she was a humanist in the sense of understanding that th the problem of capitalism is that human relations take on the form of relations between things. And the only resolution of that is the creation of new human relations in which people treat each other decently and with reciprocity and care. And that's shown, I think, in the way she lived, as well as what she wrote. Well, Luxembourg was a firm a supporter and advocate of democracy, including liberal democracy. Um, she argued that a liberal democratic, what we might call a democratic republic, is the best form in which to carry out the class struggle because if workers cannot organize openly, if they cannot form trade unions, if they cannot fight for improvements in their everyday conditions, if they're subjected to dictatorial or authoritarian conditions in which this kind of political mobilization is not possible, it's gonna make it much harder to agitate against the system. And in fact, when you look at the history of the 19th and the 20th century, the extent that we have what's left of democracy today, 
I think we live in post-democratic society, frankly. So we live in a kind of post-democratic world, but to the extent that we have vestiges of democratic rights, it's as a result of these social struggles. Um, but that didn't mean that Luxembourg thought that democracy within the framework of capitalism could possibly be actualized. Um, so she argued that the fight for democratic rights would not be able to be achieved in the fullest extent unless democracy was extended to the working class and unless it was extended to the economic sphere and uh, not simply the political sphere. And for that, there needed to be, therefore, a transformation of social relations and an abolition of class society and an abolition of the capitalist law of value. If people are controlled by the products of their own creation, if people are controlled by forms of domination uh, from the world market and from um, corporate power and corporate control that they can't dictate and can't uh, uh, voluntarily respond to, uh, well, then democracy becomes an empty and meaningless word. So that is why she argued there's no true democracy without socialism. But it also, of course, works the other side. There's no socialism, true socialism, without thoroughgoing democracy. Not simply liberal democracy, but a democracy that extends deeper than the confines of uh, liberal, uh, liberal uh, understanding, but that percolates and penetrates into um, workplace relationships, into workers' management of society, workers' management of social production, workers' management of social reproduction. And unless those conditions are prevalent, a uh, society cannot be considered truly democratic. But she really was one of the most thoroughgoing uh, supporters of uh, and advocates of democracy within the Marxist tradition. But she understood that um, uh, you don't turn your back, you, you try to use the democratic rights to the extent you have them within a bourgeois society, but you use them to surpass the confines of bourgeois society at the same time. She was raised in a climate in which it was assumed that uh, a single centralized vanguard party was needed in order to lead the revolution. And that it shows itself in some of her work and approaches in positive but also negative ways. But there's also her understanding, which you get a, a significant expression of in much of her work, um, that the role of a party should primarily be educational. That is, the role of the party is to stimulate class consciousness. There's always going to be class struggle. But the question is, what is the consciousness that um, is generated in the course of a struggle? But that doesn't mean that the party gives the consciousness to the masses from the outside uh, in the traditional Leninist conception, which I don't think she ever really bought into. It's rather that the party should be a kind of guide that would allow um, the masses' consciousness to grow from the framework it provides. I mean, if you think about like uh, planting grapes, you have the stick, the stake in the ground, and the stake allows the plant to grow around it, right? And then the grapes spread out around it. The stake actually, the stake is needed, otherwise the plant doesn't like grow out, right? The class consciousness doesn't grow out without the stick, the party, the organization, but the stick is not in control completely, right? The stick is just there to, so to speak, give direction, okay, uh, right? Um, and I think there was a kind of an understanding of that in her, and you especially see it in her work as a teacher in the SPA Day Party School from 1907 to 1914, where you see the list of topics and subjects that she lectured on, ancient Incan society, uh, feudalism, the Hanseatic leader of the Middle Ages, the nature of commodity production, the history of, of capitalism, pre-capitalist communal indigenous formations. You see all these types of things she was lecturing on. Why is she trying to get revolutionary activists to learn this kind of stuff as part of the struggle? Because she felt that their spontaneous struggles for emancipation would not result in the ultimate goal of socialism unless people grew out and developed uh, a fuller social and class consciousness which is what a political party can help provide, but not that it thinks for the masses, it helps to um, elicit from the masses implicit thoughts and sentiments and ideas that you then encourage people to develop on their own and think for themselves. And I think ultimately she understood that a socialist society means nothing if it's not a place where people are encouraged to think and explore life for themselves. So I don't think it's actually true that Marx didn't have a conception of socialism. I actually wrote a book to argue that he does, Marx's concept of the alternative to capitalism. Um, I just think that Marx thought that it should not be presented as a blueprint or a program imposed from outside the spontaneous struggles of the masses, 
But he had a concept of socialism, and he fought with many socialists to clarify that concept against those who had a poor understanding of it. Now, Luxembourg, I think, was very similar in this. She didn't want to outline a blueprint uh, or a outline in detail for the same reason that Eugene Debs, the great American socialist, once said, I don't want to lead the masses into the promised land of socialism because if I could, I can then lead them out. <laughs> so, uh, but at the same time, she had to have a conception of what socialist society was. Uh, planned social organization, no class society, uh, communal cooperative ways of living and organizing life, reciprocity, uh, a, a fundamentally organic connection to nature. I mean, a lot of these and more specific elements than this was certainly involved in her understanding. But I think why she was very interested in pre-capitalist social formations is that she saw elements of that future form of life that Marxists advocate for as socialism or communism are buried within or contained within indigenous social formations existing at the time in the developing world. So when she looks, for instance, at the uh, communal social formations in northern India or in Algeria or among the Native Americans, which she wrote about quite a bit in her introduction to political economy, she sees many forms of social relationships and communal forms of living that she says are far superior to what we have in capitalism. So it's not true that these are backward formations, which the colonialists all argue. They're actually superior in many respects from capitalist modernity. And she makes it very explicit, she says directly in the introduction to political economy, that in order to understand the form of society that must emerge in the future, we must understand these indigenous communal formations that still may exist in the present. Because that's where the idea of socialism has to be, has to draw from, okay? So uh, ironically, in developing this, she was doing something very parallel to what Marx was doing at the end of his life. The last 10 years of his life, Marx is studying the third, what we now call the developing world, the third world, and studying some of the same indigenous communal formations and drawing similar kinds of conclusions. She didn't know about this work that Marx was doing because those works, writings of Marx were not available at the time, uh, but she was using some of the same sources that actually Marx was using, like notebooks of Ko uh, Maxim Kovalevsky, a Russian sociologist. So there's a real interesting convergence here uh, at, that both thinkers were very interested in non-Western forms of life, not because they provide the answers to what socialism is, but because they provide important um, foundations for uh, conceptualizing a genuine communism or socialism that uh, goes beyond simply saying, let's get rid of the market, nationalize property, and have state control of production. Uh, that's what socialism came to mean in much of the 20th century, and we know that proved to be a total disaster. Right. Um, very early on, she was only 24 years old at the time, in 1895, she had already but she was paying close attention to what was going on in the rest of the world. And a really good question here is, why was she? <laughs> I'm not sure I have the answer to that. But especially, she was attuned to the problem of colonialism and, and, and imperialism from very early on, even before the word imperialism itself was coined. Um, so in, early as 1895, the Sino-Japanese War, she said, signals a new stage of world politics, the war between Japan and China, because she says uh, what's happening is a new, a new type of global carving up of the world by the Western powers in Japan that's going to lead to tremendous upheaval in the coming decades. Um, and she was very attuned to this and very um, um, increasingly critical of uh, Western colonialism and imperialism, especially as she saw the impact of developments like uh, German imperialism's um, uh, genocide against the uh, Nama and Herero people in modern day Namibia, which was uh, conducted by General von Trotta, who as you probably know, later became a mentor to the young Adolf Hitler. Um, where they exterminated over 100,000 people in Southwest Africa. She was one of the few uh, Marxists at the time to raise a huge hue and cry over this and was vociferously critical of, of German and European militarism and imperialism for what they were doing, especially to the carving up of Africa. Um, and this is a continuous theme in her work, but she ran against resistance within members of the Socialist International over this issue there were anti-colonial uh, figures as well as, uh, in addition to Luxembourg, within the Second International, and some extremely important ones. I mean, we could mention the Dutch great socialist Snevelet, who actually went to Indonesia, what's now Indonesia, uh, when it was a Dutch colony, and helped to agitate the first, developed the first early communist movement in Indonesia, eventually became the largest communist party in the world until it was destroyed in the mid-60s in a genocide backed by US imperialism. But in any case, the point is that um, <coughs> There were others who were with her in this kind of anti-colonial emphasis, but much of the party was opportunistically 
downplaying criticism of colonial policy enabled to get increased electoral votes. And in 1910, when Germany and France almost came to war over who's going to grab Morocco, and the German party kind of backed off from public protests against the Germans, Germany's effort to seize Morocco, uh, she not only uh, sharply criticized the government, but she criticized the leader of the second, theoretical leader of the second international, Karl Kautsky, for not taking a strong enough position against this. And she was earlier allied with him for many years against Bernstein and others on the, on the reformist right. The key thing, though, is by 1911 or 1912, she's now trying to think out how does this, is, this, is colonialism and imperialism simply a subjective policy in the part of political leaders, um, or does it flow from the innards of the very logic of capital itself? And that was a big debate that was going on at the time that was op going on within the Second International that she plunged into. And she made a rather unique uh, argument on this, which is that since uh, capitalist reproduction, the reproduction of capital on an expanding scale, uh, can only take place if surplus value is realized. That is, if the surplus product is personally consumed. Because if you produce something that's not consumed, then it has no, the value that's embodied in it does not get realized or actualized. But she argued, the workers cannot consume the full social product because they get paid too little and capitalists are always trying to repress their wage growth. The capitalists can't make up for the difference because even their luxury goods consumption does it make up for the consumption of the social product? So what prevents capitalism from collapsing due to a lack of effective demand? She says the only thing that enables it to keep going is that it has to find another agent of personal consumption to soak up the social product. And she said that is those living in non-capitalist strata in the developing uh, global south. That was so, so, so imperialism is driven, she says, not by political motives, motives alone. The political motives are just a reflection of an economic drive to realize surplus value. And that is what drives capitalism, and imperi capitalism into imperialism. I mean, I happen to think the theory is misguided. Uh, I think there's a better explanation for what drives uh, imperialism, and that is not the lack of personal consumption by uh, social agents, but rather uh, decline the rate of profit, which uh, is developed by Marx in Volume 3 of Capital. And we can have a long discussion on uh, why Luxembourg didn't agree with that theory and why there's maybe some problems in that. But in any case, um, the benefit of what she was doing, at least, was trying to theorize the inseparable connection, the internal connection between Western capitalism and non-Western non-capitalism. Um, and that one depends upon the other. The, cap the, 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 the former depends upon the latter. Um, and um, so is, in this sense, she was uh, really one of the most, not only a fervent uh, activist against colonial, uh, colonialism and imperialist domination, but she was one of the few in the Marxist tradition to develop a thoroughgoing theory that tried to explain why this would not only be happening in her time, but why it would repeatedly occur so long as capitalism continued in existence. And there are some people who today would argue, and I think it's a, it's, a worth, it's a valid argument in many respects, that this is what explains why it continues today. Capitalism doesn't only colonize specific territorial geographical areas, uh, which are not yet fully capitalist. It also colonizes areas of everyday life that are not yet fully commodified. Uh, women's domestic labor, for instance, the commodification of education, the commodification of uh, of uh, what's previously open access, et cetera, right? All these forms of, of the life world that are outside the commodity form, capitalism has to colonize in order to satisfy his thirst for the augmentation of surplus value. And as long as that occurs, well, what we know the logical result of this is that it uh, leads to the ultimate destruction of the planet uh, because when you have an unlimited drive to accumulate value in a world of finite, limited resources, eventually the two come into complete conflict with each other and you get a you get ecological uh, disaster which is actually we're right in the middle of today roser as you probably could imagine was a multilingual right um and very bright and everything else but she has very and she has very strong opinions and she wasn't afraid to argue and fight with people who argued and fought with her, or even if they didn't fight with her, she would start one uh, if she thought it was necessary. So there's a socialist conference that's occurring, a conference of the Second International that's occurring. Um, and uh, Jean Juarez, who's the leader of the French Socialist Party, 
takes the floor and is, it begins to uh, really denounce Luxembourg. It says Luxembourg is far out on this question. She's, she's, she's a rambunctious, she's extremist. She is not being even rational in this discussion. He's really going at after her. Now, of course, you have to have the talks translate into different languages simultaneously because it's Socialist International Conference, people speaking, you know, German, French, Norwegian, et cetera, et cetera, whatever else, yes? So then the time comes that right after he sits down, the person stands up, the tr German translator starts translating his comments into German. Um, but as he's translating them, Luxembourg can hear, because he can, of course, know the French as well as the German, uh, that um, he's uh, taking out some of the ugly, you know, he's smoothing it over, he's prettying it up, right? Taking out some of the dirty words, attacks on her to be a little diplomatic. She jumps up in the middle of, the, of his comments. She says, you are not accurately reflecting the attack on me. I will translate his comments instead. And then she proceeds to uh, recount Juarez's vicious attack on her in the very ugly words that he used himself. I mean, I really, I, I love that kind of anecdote because I think it kind of shows you her objectivity as a person, right? That um, she, 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 was, she, she was willing to defend herself against attack, but she didn't want um, to, uh, she wanted an honest presentation and exchange of views. And she was able to then sit down an hour later with somebody like him and break bread with him and have a comradely discussion. I mean, I, I mean even her, in the midst of her most bitterest disputes with Lenin, and there was a lot of reasons they had bitter disputes, they would often then get together, as a famous story of Lenin coming over to her apartment afterwards and sitting there, and she writes a letter saying, oh, he's one of the most remarkable people I've ever met. We had such a great time. He went through two bottles of wine. You know, um, she was able to have that quality about her. And that's part of the humanism that you asked about at the beginning, I think, that this, uh, she, she was in love with the human personality and the human character, and she wanted to be authentic and honest as a person as possible.